I'm on a mission to celebrate the best of British pies and puds. I hope you'll take inspiration from my recipes and try some of this tasty grub for yourself. Welcome to Pies and Puts. Sweet or savoury, there's something for everyone, as I show you how to make simple recipes, many of which create an entire meal in a dish. Here's what's coming up on the show today. My taste buds get put through their paces with the help of the Clifton Chili Club. That's got a beautiful flavour as well. And I give an old favourite, chili con carne, a new lease of life, topped with freshly baked cornbread. And Chili Club members Jim and Dave get me to add even more heat. Which ones do you want in yours? Dorset Naga. Dorset Naga. <laughs> and I can't resist exploring my favourite breakfast spread as I make a flourless cake with almond and marmalade. Award-winning preserve maker Victoria Cranfield is here to expand my horizons. Wow. That's got the jasmine. Woo! and edible flowers like you've never seen before. Incredible cake designer Peggy Portion shows me what's involved in creating them. Would I go through to the next round with that? Well, I'll give it another try, yes. <laughs> if strawberries are for you, you will love my delicate mousse cake. You see how light it is? You can still see all the bubbles in it. All my guests get to tuck into today's tasty treats. And all my recipes on today's show are on the BBC website. The good old chilli. We British love it. It's heat and flavour, whether in curries, on pizzas or even in chocolate. But there are some people who take things just a little bit too far. Meet the Clifton Chilli Club. Based in Bristol, they get together to share their passion for this seriously hot and spicy. And it's not just about eating, they grow their own chilies too. Chilies come in all shapes and sizes, not to mention heats. And to be honest, I wouldn't call myself a curry head diehard, but I want to meet them to see if I can discover what makes them tick. What have we got here? What's this one? It's called an RG hot from the family of RG um, chili peppers. You get an RG lemon um, and other RG citrus flavoured um, chilies. It's, it, it has got a real citrus kick to it, that chili. Really good flavoured chili, but citrusy. The heat of a chili is measured in Scoville units. The hotter the chili, the higher the number. Your average jalapeno on a pizza might well be around 4,000 on the scale, but that's nothing. These guys wouldn't even look at a chili below 20,000 Scovilles. And I was always told that the smaller the chili, the, the, the bigger the punch with the heat. Is that about, is that about right? It's not necessarily, but it is pretty much the case. If you think of a bell pepper, what you'd use to chop into mm. a salad, that's pretty much the starting point. On the Scoville scale, that's zero. And then it goes up from there. So as a general rule of thumb, the smaller, the hotter, but not necessarily. So this chilli looks pretty harmless. Anywhere between 20 and 30,000 scovels. That is nearly seven times hotter than a jalapeno chilli. Surprisingly, these guys can taste flavour behind all that heat. What are these here, these yellow ones? Sort of yellow, green ones, really, aren't they? Mm. That's another form of the RG uh, family. Yeah. So a Mexican chilli. Um, spicy and flavourful, but that citrus flavour again. Is it quite strong on the Scoville? Is it quite pungent? You know, it's yes. Hot. Yeah. yeah. It is. But, but uh, the RG family is sort of 100 to 200,000, so wow. we've gone up quite a, quite a level. And moving on to this one here, you've got the green and the red, and obviously that looks more like a, a pepper yes. than it does a chilli. Like a sweet pepper. Yeah. Is, what is this, then? That's the Crimson Lee. Um, really, really nice. It's very sweet, very, very sweet. So it's a chilli. But, you know, you could probably call it a chilli pepper. The Clifton Chilli Club have become infamous. Sauce makers send them their new products to be reviewed on their YouTube channel. 
We get sent um, sources from all around the world. Um, some uh, some importers in the UK um, they specialise in it, and sometimes they send us a little box of goodies. We get them, try them, review them, um, and give our honest opinion. I'm a coma man, so I'm probably in the wrong area at the moment. The guys assure me that my delicate and refined taste buds won't be permanently damaged by chilly heat. This one here, the yeah. smoked chipotle, what, what sort of level will that be? Um, that one uh, is, is like a, a nice spicy daddy sauce. I mean, jalapenos are around about three to 5,000 mm. um, as a standard. So here goes, a sauce with jalapeno chilli in it. That's really good, that. That one didn't affect me too much. It wasn't a serious kick. The chilli club, though, have something stronger up their sleeves. Chocolate habanero chilli is the chilli. A chocolate habanero chilli can be as much as 500,000 on the Scoville scale. It tastes like habanero, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's actually hit uh, sides and right at the back. Yep. I think this sauce um, would work really well with some good quality clotted cream ice cream. Uh, it would counterbalance the heat, the two flavours. That would go really well with ice cream. Yeah. Well, I can feel it there now as well. That My eyes are watering. Is that a normal reaction? <laughs> What's happening in your body when this is all happening? Um, first of all, you, it's your pain receptors, and that's what gives you the, the heat, the sensation of burning. How do you combat eating a chilli, feeling the reaction of what's happening inside my body? Milk is a, and any dairy product is very, very good. Um, basically what it does, it goes in and it coats the mouth, so it instantly tries to cover the nerve endings. It's like a, a milky, oily layer and straight on there. This is when Chili Dave ate a raw seven-pot habanero over a million on the Scoville scale. <laughs> Eating chili regularly does allow your taste buds to become acclimatised to the heat, but there is one jar on the table even they can't open yet. This one's called the, the sauce, mm -hmm. um, and that's 7.1 million Scoville. That's why that's under lock and key. It's <laughs> just, just in case it gets in the wrong hands. I can hardly believe there is a market for a sauce that's that hot. Definitely not for me. But I'm here to find a chili that will work in my pie. These are Hungarian hot wax. It's quite a meaty chili, it's quite a fleshy chili. On the Scoville scale and things, I would say there are about 2,000 Scovilles, so. I know this is much milder than what these guys eat, but I'm stopping here. This will do nicely. Are these, are these ripe now? As you can see, there, some chilies are, are yellow and uh, turning green, um, others are going orangey and red. From our point of view, use a red one. That's okay. it. It's ripest, most mature, most flavoursome, and most hot as well. In terms of heat value in a chilli, people think the seeds are the hottest part of the chilli. They're not. Oh. Where the seeds join the chilli, there's like a membrane, like a, a pith in an orange, and that contains all the natural oils of the chilli, and that's the hottest part. Oh, so when right. chefs de-seed chilies, what they're doing is scraping out the oil and the membranes rather than the seeds. Ah, oh, right, OK. But, generally, down here is the... Uh, not the hottest part of the chilli, so right. if you want to try a bit, yeah. that's a good place to start. OK. Now, you'll find it's quite a fleshy chilli, good flavour, and a bit of heat slightly builds up on it. Mm. It's a slow burn, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Very, very low. Very, very low. That's got a beautiful flavour as well. Very pepperish, you know, sort of chilli pepperish. Mm. Um, but it's, it's almost like a like black peppercorn. It's got that, mm. you know, you can just... But it's not overpowering. I'm liking this more than I expected. There's flavours going on here, not just heat. I'm going to enjoy that, actually. <laughs> um, I'm going to take some of these, actually. Do you mind if I use one of these? That, that, is, that bit of heat now, and I can feel it building up, is perfect for my recipe. <laughs> no problem. Thanks very much indeed, guys. Thank you very, Thank you very much. It. Thank you. Along with my Hungarian hot wax chilli, my pie is a rich, meaty filling of slow-cooked shin of beef, topped with an easy cornbread lid to soak up the spicy sauce. Hot-footing it here from Bristol with the ingredients for my chilli beef cornbread pie are Jim and Dave. Hi, fellas. Hi. The chilli boys have brought with them some of the hottest chilies they know. Um, this one here is the... Uh... Dorset Naga, which used to be a 
uh, world record holder, and that's created down in Dorset, I, I, as the name suggests. Mm -hmm. um, that one alone is about 900,000 on the Scoville scale. Um, which is okay. a, a nice one. That's a hot one. Yeah, and then this one is the uh, Butch T. Um, this rates about 1.4 million Scoville. <laughs> the juice of raw chilies can be painful in your eyes or cuts, so handle them with care. You're going to have to eat one of these hot chilies. Which one are you going to have? Or one of these super hot? Either or the other, or the naga, Dorset naga. OK, I'll go for the Dorset naga. Dorset naga. Let me just cut it up. Do you want me to cut it? You can cut it, yeah. All right. <laughs> Don't try this at home, folks. Leave it to the professionals. This could be painful. It won't be. <laughs> what is it? It's only 900,000. Oh, that's for me, isn't it? That's for you. <laughs> you, you. You sound nervous. There you go. Thank you very much. So this is 900,000 on the Scoville. Are you absolutely certain? <laughs> 100%. You don't have to. No, no, it's fine. OK, I've got mine. This is a Hungarian hot wax. What's yeah. this one? Uh, about three to 6,000. Here we go. I'll try this one. All right, go on, then. That's the tree. I've got some milk if you want some, OK? Cheers. I didn't actually expect them to eat a raw piece at all. <laughs> I'm feeling the heat on this one. You're at 900,000. 900, 900, 900, 900, no, it's certainly hot. I mean, you get the, wow. the different heat. I don't know how it's affecting you. Have you got a, on the tongue or a certain part? I'm getting... <clears throat> I'm getting it on the side, but it's it's not that bad. Right. I mean, it, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's controlled some milk. Now, milk is the best thing to have when you've had chilli, not water. Water enhances it and makes it even worse. And the milk acts as like a, a coating that covers your uh, your taste buds and your pain senses. So, uh, how, how are you feeling, guys? Uh, yeah, good, but that's one hot chilli. That is one hot chilli. 900,000 on Scoville's, nothing to be sniffed at. OK, I'm going to get cracking with the cooking. Over here, I've got a pan, a little bit of oil inside. Now, I'm going to be using shin of beef. It's got more kick to it, yeah. um, ironically. <laughs> so, what I'm gonna do... <laughs> so what I'm going to do is add the chilli to this as well, but not at this stage. So the first off, I'm just going to put the meat in and brown it off. Now, what's the point of a chilli like that with the heat? Is it purely down to the fact that because you can? I mean, they're hybrids, aren't they? They've been made, they've been grown specifically yeah. for their heat. Yeah. For what purpose? A lot of countries, I mean, we've got a, a chilli there called the Seven Pot uh, Habanero, um, you know, and the legend goes, basically, one chilli, can, you can cook seven pots of curry. So, effectively, you know, if you want a really super hot curry or uh, a dish of some form, then you just put one chilli or two or three chillies in it. Um, and uh, then you've got the milder ones, like the Hungarian hot wax, and that's a really good sort of general product that you can use. Um, and it's the flavour, but then you just up it and up it as well, so you can get the different flavours and the different textures. When the beef is sealed, I'm allowing it to rest and reusing the same pan for my chopped white onions, oregano, tomato puree, garlic, and some unsweetened cocoa powder. A bit unusual? It is unusual. I mean, it goes with beef. I mean, it, game it goes particularly well with. But chilli and chocolate? Yeah. The, the whole thing about chocolate is it's not just sweet. The purer the cocoa, the more bitter it is, and then the bitter goes with the savoury dish. OK. Just browning off those onions, sweating them down a little bit. This chilli is a Hungarian hot wax. Mild to these guys, but certainly hot enough for me. Having tried this raw, I feel I can take this fella. You know, I feel quite sure? comfortable with this one, yeah. This is where your store cupboard ingredients come into their own. Add tin plum tomatoes and slice roasted red peppers from a jar. A tin of red kidney beans and rich beef stock. Give that a stir and at that stage, you can put your meat back in and then leave that to cook for about two hours, just on a simmer, just pop a lid on it and then leave it alone. All those juices will infuse and it will break down and be a magnificent colour. Earlier, I made a filling suited to my taste buds. It only has one mild chilli in it. I think we need to pack this up for you. Listen, guys, you're the chilli people here. Now, I'm making a, a technically a chilli con carne with a sort of cornbread top. Which one do you want in yours? You can have both. Dorset Naga. Dorset Naga. How many? Two? Yeah. So, it's gloves time. I'm using gloves for obvious reasons. If I case I rub my eye and the resin that comes from the oil that comes from this 
very hot dorset naga chili. Now, these are going to pack a little bit of a punch. It's only spice it up a little bit. It should, shouldn't it? Mix that into the dish. So you've still got the other chili in there, but now it's just going to kick you in the teeth. OK? <laughs> so that really is a proper chili beef sitting right there. Now, the topping, and use cornbread. If I run through the ingredients, you've got polenta, it's that beautiful yellow, you've got baking powder and you've got flour. The polenta or cornmeal, as it's sometimes called, will give my topping a gorgeous yellow colour and creamy corny flavour. Add two eggs, enriched, and melted butter. And then what I'm going to do is chop up this chilli. Now, it's like a chilli fest. You've got chilli in the dish, you've got chilli in the cornbread as well. And again, just roughly chop this up. This is a green Hungarian hot wax chilli, so it's going to have more bitter flavour than the red. Mix together, then I'm adding buttermilk as it's slightly acidic and will react with the baking powder in the oven, giving the topping an extra rise. It should be like a thick batter. Well, it looks great with the, the, the chilies in it. You can see it now. You can. Um, and just the little bits in there. So, yeah, it's something different, isn't it? Stir until you get a soft dropping consistency. So I'm happy with that. So what we need to do now is fill these little trays, get some of this gorgeous mixture, and make sure we get those chilies in there. I've just seen a massive one go in there now. You must cook with these things a lot as well at home. What do you think happens to the chilli when you cook it? A lot of the heat in the chilli will obviously dissipate through the dish, so you've got quite a nice, rich sauce there, so it will pick up all the way through that gravy. The flavour and the heat of the chilli won't be lost by heating it up. Yeah, I'm looking forward to trying this. Are you going to try one of these hot ones? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Spoon your cornbread mixture generously over your chilli. This is what you call a proper pie, you know? Yeah. Good wholesome pie. Oh, yes. Now, there's our filled dish. I'm just going to add a bit of cheese to that at the top of that as well. And is this a sort of low-tasting chilli? It's not a cheddar or...? Yeah, you can use a cheddar. cheddar. I mean, it's, do you not think there's enough flavour <laughs> in there already? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so these are your dishes, guys. To make sure I know which one are the really hot ones, I'm going to put a ring of chilli on the top of each one, like that. Now, this is going to go straight in the oven to bake, 180, 35 minutes, golden brown. And what I did a little bit earlier is something which I find suits my palate more with a slightly milder chilli in there. So these beauties are my chilli beef cornbread pies. The rich, meaty filling and soft but crunchy cornbread make these pies a comfort food masterpiece. So go on, be brave and load them up with chilli heat too. Guys, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer for yours. Indeed. They look lovely, absolutely lovely. Still to come today. My flourless cake made soft with ground almonds and given a kick with marmalade. You've got something with jasmine on it, with that orange marmalade cake, would be absolutely delicious. And my strawberry mousse cake, light fruit flavours on a Genoese sponge base. The smells are incredible. The smell is absolutely gorgeous on this. Nature makes many flowers that you can eat, but these have all been crafted by hand from sugar. These edible flowers are attracting a lot of attention, and it's hardly surprising that their creator already has an impressive list of clients, including Kate Moss, Sir Elton John, Gwyneth Paltrow and Sir Anthony Hopkins all fans of these exquisitely designed flowers. And I'm honoured that the designer Peggy Portion has come into my kitchen with her assistant Olivia to help her prepare the sugar pastes. Welcome, Peggy. Looking at these flowers and these cakes, are they botanically, are they perfect? Probably not botanically. Um, I do take inspiration from the real flower, but um, my flowers I would call stylized rather than botanically perfect. Right. And which, which one? I mean, the one that stands out for me at the moment looking at it, 
are those over there. They look incredible. Yeah, they are three peas, and um, it's made up of four petals per blossom. Then the next one in the front is a peony, very intricate and very frilly. Um, and then on the front, you've got a vintage uh, sugar rose with hydrangeas, uh, an orchid, an anemone, and a dahlia. I mean, when you look at the ones behind us as well, the decoration that goes into one yeah. cake like that, yeah. It does look stunning, and, and botanically, for me, some of them look real, you know, you have to take a second look. For s something like that, how long would it take? Uh, probably, if I did it all myself, I would probably be working almost a week on this. A week? Yes, because you also have drying stages. Um, you need to dust each individual petal with petal dust, uh, tape them together, steam them. There are lots of little stages involved to make oh, flour. Mm -hmm. OK, what's it actually made from? Um, it's made from flour paste, sugar flour paste, which is basically um, like a make of, made of icing sugar. When you do these big commissions, when people come along, um, you're dealing with, with, with people who want the next level up. Do they want something that's out the box? Yes, we usually work on a bespoke basis, and a lot of our customers come to us and want something that hasn't been there before. So I sketch cakes from scratch and uh, develop designs for them based on, on their personal taste and style. I actually studied as a sculptor in art school yeah. originally, and this is it almost comes into that realm, yeah. doesn't it, of mm -hmm. sculpting yeah. and the yeah. use of food and creating something. Yeah, exactly. So I thought we'd try something simple to begin with, which is the mould um, sugar rose. And that's simple, is it? Uh, fair. It's a good beginner's rose, I'd say. Now also, for this uh, rose, you don't need any tools or cutters. You just literally need the paste and um, a plastic sheet from an office supply. This is just an acetate folder you might buy in any stationer's. Take small pieces of sugar paste and roll into balls about the size of a hazelnut. It's weird. It's like... Um... It's a bit like plasticine, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's sort of stretchy, but it will set eventually quite firm. Yeah, OK. So, yeah, then fold the plastic over and just flatten them a little bit so they don't roll away. I've never actually done anything like this before. <laughs> not, not as intricate, not like this, anyway. Certainly not like this. The petals are formed by smoothing down the ball to an oval shape and thinning one side. A little bit thinner there, otherwise your petals look a bit chunky. Oh, right. I don't want chunky, do we? <laughs> this just feels great doing this. To create the petal, roll round the sugar paste, keeping the top open. Then take the second petal and overlap the first. Tuck in the next petal and repeat the overlapping technique, just like I'm attempting to do. And now go with your last layer of petals. Same process, you know, over the open edge. Yeah. First one, and then lay the petals around. Slightly higher again, or? A little bit, yes. Okay. That's not too bad. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just fold the upper part of the petal back as well and give it a little pinch that makes it look quite realistic and natural. I'm getting into this, Peggy. <laughs> yeah, are you enjoying it? Yeah. Good. Not bad. It is a little bit what we would call a cabbage rose. I was going to say, it doesn't really look like a rose. It looks like a new flower. But you know what? Roses really improve his practice. And uh, this rose is one, whenever I have a new trial for a new staff member coming in, I always give them the rose to do first and yeah. like, let them do ten of them. Yeah, because yeah. I want to see a bit of improvement between the first and the last Ooh. one. You see that? If, I mean, if I saw that on a cake, I think that's brilliant. Give me that. Would you mark me out of ten? Would I go through to the next round with that? Well, I'll give it another try, yes. <laughs> OK. Well, it sounds like my first attempt at making roses wasn't so bad. Later on, Peggy will be making some more sugar paste decorations to go on top of my strawberry mousse cake. My next recipe is a delicious flourless cake using ground almonds and semolina instead. I think you should always use the best ingredients you can when you're baking, and the secret to this cake is marmalade. And who better to turn to for marmalade than a champion marmalade maker? In a small pocket of North Devon, there's something magical happening. In a secluded garden, there are pots of green, yellow and gold, glowing in the sunlight like coloured jewels. These marmalades are made by Victoria Cranfield. She is one of many artisan preserve makers springing up all over the UK. 
but I've asked her to come up with a brand new flavour. This one is St Clement's, which is 50% oranges, 50% lemons. It's light, zesty. This one is a sweet orange one, which is basically sweet oranges with that little baby. <laughs> Even Victoria's marmalade can't escape a chilli, and these are hot scotch bonnets. Works really well with fruit toast. Victoria's passion for creating the best flavours has won her some seriously impressive awards. This one is the pink grapefruit marmalade that got the double gold in 2012 at the World Marmalade. If you like pink grapefruit, it it's knocks your socks off. Surprisingly, marmalade hasn't always been Victoria's first love. I've been a lawyer, I've been a builder, I've been an antique dealer and a rag and bone merchant, more or less. I've done a lot of things, but I've done cooking, marmalades and jams longer than any of the others. I've set Victoria a challenge. I've given her the recipe for my almond and marmalade cake, and as she is the expert, I want her to create a new marmalade that's perfect for this pod. It's a great challenge, and I love that kind of challenge. To come up with something that's going to complement another flavour, it's, it's what I really enjoy, to be honest. But it's not going to be easy. What I want is for my marmalade to shine out of that cake. We're going to need some lemons. These need to ideally be thin skinned, otherwise, you get a load of pit. Lemons, quite frankly, are the backstop. These are your guaranteed source of pectin. They will help whatever I do set, so I need lemons. Nectarines. Peaches, peaches, peaches. This is how to annoy your greengrocer and all this fruit. Chilies again is a no escape. Spectacular. I think golden raisins may be soaked in tea. Victoria has loaded up her trolley. I hope she knows I only need one jar of marmalade. He bung them on the table. Back in her kitchen, Victoria has enlisted the help of friends Louise and Kate. Taking on Paul's challenge is actually going to be just that because I have a stable of marmalades. He wants something different. To come up with something new and go slightly off-piste could be good. It could also be an unmitigated disaster. Add chilli. All the marmalades are made essentially the same way. The difference is the fruit. And it is fascinating to see the wide range of marmalades that are entirely different because they're picking up on the individual attributes of that fruit. And that's something I really enjoy. Marmalade is a seductive mistress. She'll only do what she wants in her own time. Marmalades are meant to be punchy. They're meant to be full of fruit. They're meant to shock you. They shock your taste buds in the morning. And I think they're great. And they're underrated. And you can use them in lots of things. And hopefully they'll work in this cake. So after hours of shredding, boiling and testing, have the ladies come up with something they like? I think we can say this isn't the one that's going up to Paul. Um, we will need to revisit the ingredients, come again afresh at it tomorrow, and um, hopefully we'll come up with something better. We'll work on the other ideas. That yeah, we, um, I think down. so. Victoria is clearly a marmalade perfectionist, but if at first you don't succeed, try again. And I can't wait to see if they've done it. So, did Victoria manage to come up with the right combination of flavours for me to use in my marmalade cake? Well, I can ask her because she's here in the kitchen with me. Hello, Victoria. Hi. Um, fantastic looking marmalades and a champion marmalade maker. Yay. So let's run through some of these okay. flavours that you've got here. Now, I'm looking for one to go in the cake. Yeah. So what have we got here? What's the first one? This one is the one that was filmed and I wasn't happy with it. But see what you think. Spicy orange marmalade. Yeah. The idea behind this was was my hot orange marmalade, which mm -hmm. we then added some sultanas brandy to, but we weren't getting those notes coming through. That's nice. Hmm. No, it's not bad, is it? I didn't think that would add anything particularly to your cake. 
It's got such a lovely texture to it, though, which is what you really want on a marmalade. I, I you, love marmalade. I love that sort of uneven um, texture. It's not like a jam, which you can get really smooth. This is... It's rough, you know, and on top of your toast. Yeah. I mean, that's why that's that's where marmalade comes but, but onto its own. Don't just keep it to taste. If that's the start of a ten, that's a good that's a good Excellent. marmalade. Right. I thought that really what you wanted was something that would add to the cake. Yeah. And I sort of had a little Middle Eastern feel. Victoria's next marmalade is thick shreds made of Seville oranges and jasmine. Let's see how it's oh, oh, that's sharp, isn't it? Mm. That's got several in it. This one hasn't. With this one, I thought, add another flavour, do the Middle Eastern thing, mm. and on that basis, thought jasmine. Mm. The flavour, the sharpness comes through on the oranges, yeah. the different oranges, really, really, the, the difference it's between the two. It's fascinating, just two different oranges, totally yeah. different flavours. So what's this one? This one is softer. I have learned a lot So this is this. orange and jasmine marmalade This again. is orange and jasmine again, but I've taken out the big chunks yeah. and just used the zest of the fruit. So the flavour should come through more. What do you figure? Wow. That's got the jasmine. Woo! That does carry some huge flavour. I mean, it's very, very tart. Reason I thought that would work is it's going in a cake, it's mm -hmm. going against the yep. eggs, the sh butter, so it's got to have punch to come through. OK. All right, I understand that you're thinking on that. That would be my preferred choice. This one is orange and apricot. Yep. Have a go at that. I'm letting you go first on that. Aren't I nice? Well, it's got a bit of um, body again, to this, isn't it? Again, that's because the shreds... The, you're actually using proper shreds rather than the zest. Lovely taste in orange, almost saffron-like. Normally, I wouldn't think so much about what marmalade to use, but Victoria's jars just show what a difference it could make to my cake. Decision time. Now, I've chosen to go inside the cake. Hmm. This one. I'm orange and Orange and apricot. Yeah. Maybe. But... In the icing on the top, I'm going to use the orange and jasmine marmalade for the topping as well. So I think I incorporate that somewhere. I, I, I like that flavour. You're right, it is a great yeah. flavour. But I think for the cake, I'm going to use this. I yep. like the chunky that, bits. That one is much more marmalade-y as mm. marmalade is understood. Exactly. Whereas exactly. the other one's playtime. Right, fantastic. We'll have to see what you think later. For the cake mixture, I'm creaming together the butter and the caster sugar. Add the eggs, then to start the orange flavour, the zest of an orange. The true marmalade kit comes later with Victoria's marmalade. Now, what I'm going to add to this now is some of the, the drier ingredients. Now, I've got some semolina going in there, has a little bit of crunch to it, a little bit of depth and body. And then I've got some ground almonds that are going to go in there as well. Now, you could, if you like, you could just put ground almonds in there. We have all flour and ground almonds. Baking powder in. Give that a good mix together. Finally, I'm adding a small amount of orange juice, which will help to loosen the mixture. It's quite... It's a different type of mix. This. It's not what you think of as a normal conventional sponge, because it's quite hearty, robust, big textured ingredients. And then we're good to go. Now, what I'm going to do now is get my spoon in there. I always like to finish it off with a spoon, get a feeling for the mixture. That's lovely. It's a soft mixture. Can you use a spoon throughout, other than using the beater? Because I don't have a beater. Of course you do, yeah. There's not a problem. You can It just takes a little bit more. It's very labour-intensive, you know? That's... Like marmalade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, <quite>. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm going to put three <laughs> tablespoons of your marmalade in there as well. And, again, that will slacken it down a little bit. And this is where the flavour's going to come in, those chunks in there. There's my mixture, and I'm going to pop this straight into a tin. I've lined my tin with baking parchment and buttered the edges to stop the cake from sticking. So this is going to go in the oven now, 180 degrees C for 35 minutes. Pop that straight in. And when it comes out, that's what it looks like. It's lovely and flat. Now, the thing I'm going to add to that is a lovely mascarpone-based icing. For the topping, mix together mascarpone from the fridge, icing sugar, then stir in soft, unsalted butter. 
mix all this together. That's your basic icing for the top. Today I'm lucky enough to have another of Victoria's marmalades on hand. But normally the same marmalade that went into the cake would work in the icing. Then swirl the cream cheese icing over the top of the cake with a wooden spoon. And then I'm going to get some more of this. And I think that, with that icing, which is quite sweet... It'll help cut through. Yeah, and I think it gives it more... a little bit more gumption. You've got something with jasmine on it, with orange. And I think that together, with that orange and marmalade cake, would be absolutely delicious. This rich and zingy cake is best served chilled so that the cream cheese icing is stiff and cold, then drizzle with marmalade just before eating. Where's the knife? You'll have to wait. Oh, <laughs> that does look excellent, doesn't it? But thank you for giving me your marmalade, and I hope you like what I've baked. Oh, I look forward to it. Earlier, cake designer Peggy Portion showed me how to make a sugar paste rose. A little bit thinner there, otherwise your petals look a bit chunky. Oh, right. Don't want chunky, do we? <laughs> now Peggy and her assistant Olivia are going to help me decorate my next pudding. Now I'm going to make a strawberry mousse cake. It's a very light cake and it's got strong flavours of strawberries all the way through. I've got fresh strawberries and I've got the puree going into the cake itself. Now, Peggy, it's it's not like a, a sort of stodgy cake that you can just lump yeah. stuff on. It's going to be quite a delicate thing. Yeah. You're all right with that, putting a decoration on it? Sure. I'm, um, I'm going to make some tiny sugar strawberries. Oh, cute. And then I thought we'll do some very light strawberry blossoms with that and yep. little leaves to create a really lovely gardeny Lovely. Thing. How very me. This dessert makes quite an impression, bursting with strawberry flavour. The light and fluffy mousse rests on the top of a Genoese sponge, and today I have Peggy's decorations to really set it off. OK, now to start with, what I've got in here at the moment, I've got a straight Genoese sponge at the bottom of this tin. A Genoese sponge is easy to make and a perfect base for this dish. The next thing I'm going to add is a mousse, and again, this mousse will really liven up this, and I'm using proper strawberry puree and I'm using jelly in there as well. But to kick off with, Evaporated milk into a bowl. Whisk the evaporated milk until it's bubbly. The key ingredient to create a light mousse is air, and this is when you add it in. Add cool melted jelly. This is what will help the mousse set. And finally, I blended and sieved strawberries to make a luscious puree. The smell is absolutely gorgeous on this. Fold round the outside. So that's your filling. Park that to one side. Oil around a cake tin. This will hold your lining paper in place. Top and tail them. I'm going to cut them in half. The paper will keep the strawberries in place as your mousse sets. It doesn't really matter if you can't get big strawberries. As long as all the strawberries are pretty much the same size, you can get away with it. Have you ever, have you ever made tried to make a flower you just can't make? I guess... Some of those flowers I've just made, for example, um, the peony or paratulip, it takes a little while because I don't really use um, books or instructions to learn them. I yeah. make them up myself, really. Sometimes it takes two or three goes until I'm happy with it. So um, it's just a question of time and patience, really, until you've got it right. It's the same as anything in this game, isn't it? <laughs> time and patience. <laughs> now, what I've got in there, if you look inside, I've got strawberries laced all the way around. Now I've got my mousse here. I'm going to pour that into the middle. You can see how light it is. You can still see all the bubbles in it. And that should find its own level. That goes into the fridge to chill down. And realistically, I'd leave it in there overnight if you had the chance, but four or five hours will probably be ample. Pop that in the fridge. I'll show you one that has been in the fridge. And here's one that has chilled. I'm going to pop the Spring form case off and peel the paper off. What you've actually got is that beautiful Genoese base. Then you have the strawberries. And that, even on its own, is absolutely gorgeous. If I pop that on there. But at this stage, I think I'll pass it on to Peggy. 
<laughs> There's my strawberry mousse okay. cake. So what I thought is quite nice to section the cake off, I find it always quite helpful when you're cutting it up as well. Mm -hmm. So I presume maybe eight slices, for example? Well, if you're from my neck of the woods, probably three. OK. But yeah, eight, eight is probably so more I have to be normal. careful, this is a very light mousse. It is a very light sink in. So I would just probably place one on each side. They look so cute. Very cute. And actually, I really love the colour combination of pink and red. It does, I think it goes really it's well It's a real together. strawberry fest. Yeah. Then I made some of these leaves. They're so delicate, aren't they? And then these are little, just the little white blossoms. And you know, when you look at a strawberry plant, it's got little strawberry blossoms on them, which are really cute. I think you could just place there. Does it look, look like my cake? <laughs> Is that the sort of cake that I, I have made? I made it a Peggy cake. <laughs> <laughs> you have. That's a great blend of uh, Peggy and Paul yeah. right there. Exactly. Thank you very much, Peggy. That looked fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you, Olivia. That is a beautifully decorated strawberry mousse cake. Not everybody's got a Peggy in the house, but what I would normally do is dip strawberries into melted chocolate and put them on the top. Plates. My guests are ready to eat. Today it's been all about stretching our imaginations when it comes to ingredients. My chilli beef cornbread pies were given an extra kick thanks to the Dorset Naga and chilli boys Jim and Dave. Marmalade escaped the toast rack and ended up in and on top of my almond and marmalade cake thanks to the expertise of Victoria. And my strawberry mousse, light, fluffy, irresistible and beautifully decorated with Peggy's cute miniature strawberries. I think it's time to tuck in. I think it's only right to try the, um, the chilli pies to start with. <laughs> Gentlemen, choose your weapons. I think you <laughs> <laughs> The aroma is amazing. You get a mixture of the, the chilli and the cheese. Have you hit any of the chillies yet, boys? It's definitely flavoured, but still you can really taste the, the, the shin. It hasn't actually overpowered it, yeah. but you still get the flavour. It's a lot less aggressive than I thought it would be. It's hot, but yeah. it's a very clean hot. Next, my strawberry mousse cake. It's a beautiful cake, isn't it? It's very so light. Give yourself a very big piece. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so light. Yeah. Very, very airy. It just it's melts on your good. mouth. What do you think of the, um, the presentation? It's beautiful. Wonderful. Absolutely brilliant. It's the attention to detail, and it is a form of art. Finally, that zesty marmalade and almond cake. I think it's such a lovely bitterness and sweetness mm -hmm. and the scrumptiousness of the mascarpone. It goes really, really well together. Oh, you're very nice. nice. You can like come again. <laughs> Perfect match with the mascarpone, the, um, the jasmine marmalade. Absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. But then in the, in the sponge, you're getting flecks of uh, orange peel as well, so it mm. works really well. It was a good job there with your marmalade. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well done. Shall I say I'm relieved? <laughs> <laughs> really relieved. <laughs> I think we've experienced some real indulgence today and some great food and some great company. I hope you can join me next time when I'll have more pies and puds on the menu. See you then. I think we need some more of this hot chilli.